This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just tell listeners who you are? Sure. My name is Brad Siegel. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm an activist in the Twin Cities with the Minnesota Immigrant Rights Action Committee, MIRAC. And recently you had the opportunity, I believe, uh, you said to go down to Eagle Pass and also to kind of see um, the situation for immigrants uh, coming to the U.S. across uh, the border there in Mexico. And um, and then shortly after you were there, um, the president, uh, Biden, and also uh, the guy who's thinks he's still president Trump were down there. And um, I know they were uh, uh, talking about the crisis at the border and the, uh, you know, they, they, uh, Biden had mentioned that um, he said, you know, you join me or I'll join you and get can- Congress to pass this bill that they were looking at. Um, he said it was the toughest, most efficient, most effective uh, border security bill. Um, so there's been a lot of tough words around this whole, situation of immigration uh, across the border from Mexico. Do you want to just talk about what your experience was, what you saw there, and 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 how that compares to what we're hearing on the news? Sure. Thanks so much. We went down, like you said, uh, over, it was a quick delegation for about three days, which included myself from here in Minnesota, as well as two activists from Los Angeles and one from Dallas, Texas. We all met up in San Antonio and then drove down to the border from there. There's no other easier way to get there, um, pretty remote. And we all went as part of a delegation with the Legalization for All Network, which is a national network of immigrant rights activist groups around the country. So we went down there and as, as you said, three days after we returned was when both President Biden and Trump were at the border you know, Trump went to Eagle Pass, the same place we were. He also, he's not the only Republican who's gone there to try to rile up racist venom during this election year, which we're just going to keep seeing more and more of. Um, Before he went, the Republican congressional leaders went down there to grandstand and spit racist venom. Right there. They had some right-wing religious group that did a caravan down there that was anti-immigrant and anyway so they're getting a lot of people going there from uh you know some of the most powerful people in the country trying to make immigration the the, the dividing issue in this election year as ha- often happens um and eagle pass is an interesting place so it's right on the border with mexico it's got a sister city on the other side of the Mex- uh, mexico us mexico border which is called Piedras Negras. And really the level of border militarization that exists now is unprecedented in modern U.S. history. So it it has continued to increase, whether it's been a Republican or a Democrat in the presidency, it keeps increasing with every administration. And so, but it wasn't always that way, right? Right. Not not that long ago, People who lived in Piedras Negras could just go across to Eagle Pass for lunch for the day and come back. And that was actually very common or people who worked on one side and lived on the other. And it was much more of a sister city in the sense that Minneapolis and St. Paul are sister cities where uh, even though, you know, I live in St. Paul, some people in Minneapolis think it's like St. Paul's like the other side of the world. And why would you ever go there? (laughs) But uh, uh, just kidding. Um, You know, it's very easy. You just go across a bridge. Right. And that's how things used to be a lot more like that there and now it's not that way at all you have really long lines coming into the u.s from mexico from piedras negras and so 
you know, one interesting thing, right when we first drove into Eagle Pass, you immediately see a huge law enforcement presence. And that presence is everything from local police to, I, I think, county uh, police. And then you, of course, see tons of Customs and Border Patrol vehicles. And you also see the Texas National Guard. You see the National Guard from other Republican-led states like Florida who have gone in to, quote unquote, help. Uh, and you have also U.S. Army that we saw there as well. And I can get into a little bit more about what all of those different forces are doing there. Sure. In addition, the Texas governor, Governor Abbott, who is a Republican who's basically staked his whole reputation on attacking immigrants, is uh, announced that they're built. Texas is building an army base, or I don't know if army is the technical thing. It's a Texas, Texas controlled, not federal controlled military base uh, that's going to bring 1800 more soldiers to the border there. So, wow. So Eagle Pass is a 97% Chicano and Latino town. And it's flooded with all of these law enforcement officials and heavily militarized uh, along the border and in it's a it's a small town. Right. So there's one kind of big park right on the edge of downtown that goes up to the Rio Grande, the river that divides the U.S. and Mexico. And that uh, park has been taken over by the Texas National Guard. So on, literally on the edge of downtown, it's just complete militarization. And re when we were in the downtown area. It's, I guess, like, unfortunately, a lot of towns and even bigger cities in the U.S. where downtowns are kind of run down and a lot of vacant storefronts and not a lot of activity. Um, and yeah. my my read on it is that's a direct result of all this militarization. You know, like I said before, people from Piedras Negras used to be able to come up and spend money in Eagle Pass and go back. And now that, you know, is a lot harder and also, like, who wants to go for a nice stroll next to the fenced off and militarized right, National Guard right. and guys with long guns and stuff staring at you? Um, so, ironically, though, what that and I'll talk more about this later when we talk about the Mexico side, we were able to cross into Mexico. But when we did that, we went into Piedras Negras and it was like night and day. And Piedras Negras was so alive. There were right when you cross the border, there's a huge park, lots of kids out playing. There's a shopping district called Calle Once, like 11th street. That's looked pretty fancy. I didn't see vacant storefronts, lots of people out and about. So ironically, you know, while this border militarization is supposed to be punishing immigrants, it actually punishes border towns on the U S side who are suffering right. as a result of this militarization. And it's dramatically distorting their economies to make them completely dependent on thousands of border patrol jobs and stuff rather than actually something productive in the economy. Yeah. I, uh, my mom lived in Port Isabel in, uh, in Texas for a while. And then in Brownsville, which is right across from Matamoros. And then in 2018, we did go, we went to Mexico to, um, a little further along, uh, Nuevo Progreso. And, uh, it was just like, from the U.S. side, it was just like you walked on the bridge and you put in your quarter and you went through your turnstile and you went right on in. Um, and even on the way back, I mean, it was, you know, you had to show your passport and stuff. There was a line. It was a little bit more of a pain in the butt, but it was like, it sounds like that was 2018. Like I said, I was down there again in 2019, but I didn't go to Mexico. And so, yeah, I didn't see, you know, as much of uh, the kind of, you know, militarization on the border, at least in the areas that I was at. So it was like, you could just, and, you know, of course, if you go back to, you know, what, like before the Clinton era, it was like, there was nothing really. It was just like no big deal to go, go across the border in the, you know, seventies, eighties. And uh, I don't exactly know when the border was, you know, was started to get uh, militarized, but um well, you, yeah, you I mean, that's not normal. For, that's not necessarily normal for borders to be like militarized like that. I mean, ICE has not been around that long. Um, you know, people in the United States have this feeling like that's just like, oh, borders, they're supposed to be, you know, full of military people and they're supposed to be like, you know, really secure and, you know, all this, this stuff that the media plays up. Um, so, yeah, I know uh, you also talked about... Um, 
in your post that, you know, a lot of the people, the, a lot of the migrants are children. Um, you know, that was a big piece of what you were talking about. Do you want to talk a little bit more uh, about that piece? Um, you know, that, that these, these military people with, you know, long guns, like you said, are there because of, you know, there's, there's a lot of children, basically. It's like how ridiculous it is, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who, again, has sort of staked his whole political reputation on attacking immigrants, uh, has declared, and this is sort of in official legal terms, right, declared in a quote-unquote invasion from Texas in order right. to put in place these measures like the militarization of Shelby, Shelby Park and all of the, the razor covered buoys that they put in the Rio Grande, which we also saw, and just the tons of concertina wire everywhere, et cetera. In order to do all that, they had to come up with some legal justification because immigration is a federal matter. It's not supposed to be local or right. state governments that are enforcing immigration laws. So he's had to hype up this whole rhetoric around and there's an invasion as if, you know, these laws about if the country's being invaded, a state can defend itself are literally about an army across crossing the border. And this is so not that. And right. just being able to see for ourselves, when we went into Piedras Negras, we went to two shelters where people are staying who have come there from, you know, we talked to people from Honduras, El Salvador, Haiti, Venezuela, uh, someone from one person, I think from Jamaica, we, we didn't have time to talk to everybody there. So I'm sure there are people from other countries as well. But one thing that's very notable is that so many of those countries are countries that U.S. foreign policy has destroyed in recent decades, right. either through military interventions like in Central America or through economic interventions like imposing free trade agreements that wipe out the local economy and force people to move to survive. It, or both in some cases, that's where people are coming from. Venezuela, where the U.S. has put a stifling sanctions regime because they don't like the government of Venezuela, try to try and like they do with Cuba, try to make the people cry uncle um, through trying to starve them yep. to get them to overthrow their government. Uh, and, you know, so that's the people we talked to. And the most striking thing in both of the shelters we went to was the number of children. I mean, there were so many children and not just like 17 year olds. So yeah, they're technically children, but almost adults. I mean, there were probably some 17 year olds, but so many of them were small children from babies that appeared months old to toddlers, to little kids. When we walked in a woman from Mexico, who was uh, one of our guides kind of went in and she has been there before. So she just went right up to the kids and got them all to circle around and was telling them a story and getting them to all laugh and stuff. And, you're having story time with kids who are literally the supposed invasion that these Republicans are talking about. This right. billions of dollars of border militarization and thousands and thousands of federal troops at the border and all of this, you know, vile racist rhetoric from people like Trump and Governor Abbott, all to demonize children. It's when when you just think about that, it's so gross and it's just mm -hmm. so outrageous. That yeah, that that was one of the most notable things for me. And the so the first shelter we went to, we got to spend more time. We brought some food down there from a church in Eagle Pass that um, does work feeding immigrants that come through Eagle Pass, but they also donate food down to the shelters in Piedras Negras. So we brought food down there, helped stock the kitchen, and then we went to a second shelter which was smaller. And by this time it was evening so it was dark outside and we go in and there's no lights in the shelter and when we asked they said yeah the electricity hasn't worked for several days you know and we just brought a wow. little bit of food some you know sweets for kids and stuff and everyone was just so happy to see us and wanted to tell their stories because they're leaving their countries people don't pack up with nothing except the clothes on their backs and whatever they can carry to go across two, three, four, five borders, you know, walking hundreds or even thousands of miles just for fun or because right. they believe in the American dream even. It's not that at all. And one person even told us directly, he's like, I'm not 
looking for a, a better life or an American dream. I'm just looking for a little bit safer life because the gangs in my country are threat are threatening us, you know, that if we don't join them, they're going to kill us. And right. so we had to get out. And that's the reality of, of migration. And that's the reality of what um, the U.S., by putting in place all of these super extreme anti-immigrant laws, is sentencing those people to a life of in extreme precariousness and surviving day to day coming through Mexico, where, of course, there are cartels and gangs in Mexico that prey on immigrants coming through. And so we heard stories like from two women about uh, one who talked about how um, they, whoever it was, criminals in Mexico sort of took their son away and then took her away. Um, and she didn't go into detail about what happened to them or what they had to do to be released but clearly it's it's a business right it, it's it's people who are vulnerable and desperate being right. preyed on so that uh either demanding money or demanding you know whatever um so people go through all of this to just get to the the border and hope for hope to be granted an a asylum interview and that's where you know it, and and all all this talk about illegal immigration is just inaccurate, right? The there's an internationally recognized and recognized nationally within U.S. law right to asylum, appear, right to appear exactly. to border agent and request asylum. That's perfectly legal, and so people should be allowed to do that. And um, that's what under the Trump administration they tried to take that away almost entirely, and with a, this quote unquote remain in Mexico kind of policy where people wouldn't be allowed to present themselves to a border agent, which is a violation of law um, and just a violation of right. and interna yeah, international law as well, right? That they are supposed to be able to present for asylum. Yeah, exactly. And so we, one other anecdote I'll tell quickly is that when we were on the Mexico side, after we visited the shelters, we walked down right along the Rio Grande, um, you know, along the river there that divides the U S and Mexico on the Mexico side, it's just a little park where with little benches and you can sit and there was a, fu a full moon or a near full moon. So we were watching the moon. It was really pretty. And um, then suddenly some, it, but you, you look across to the U.S. side and it's just huge floodlights focused on the water and on Mexico, tons and tons of uh, razor wire, these huge military vehicles, et cetera. And um, the contrast just couldn't be more stark. Right. And Right. We actually saw while we were sitting there, some Mexican police pulled up near us and they're like, oh, we, we heard a report that uh, someone was drowning in the river. Did you see anyone drowning? Um, and we were like, no, we haven't seen anyone drowning. But then we did see somebody. There was a what appeared to be a woman who had actually made it to the near the U.S. side and she was still in the water. And then we kind of watched as she went up on the, the the land there right up against where the, the razor wire starts. And couldn't hear from where we were obviously it was too far away but <clears throat> it appeared that she was asking to be let in you know to uh, i assume request asylum and they wouldn't let her through the the razor wire and so she they made her get back in the water and the water was really high and choppy that day from what the local people were telling us and so that's putting her life at risk to in in violation right. of her right to present herself and so she went further down the river where to where we couldn't see her anymore but yeah, and this was like a, what appeared to be a woman by herself. It wasn't like hordes of people invading the country, any of this kind of stuff. Right, was, right. And they turned her away. Right, and they've and, also been, you know, they've been obscuring some of those numbers, uh, you know, I mean, that, that they did under the Trump administration. They changed the way that they manage all that stuff. I don't remember exactly all the details, but they started calling them encounters and other things, so they're not included in the regular statistics. So sometimes when you look at the statistics, it looks like, you know, maybe some of these administrations aren't as bad as, as we know they are. But then if you start digging into the numbers, they, they categorize things under like multiple different uh, places. And then, and then if you present yourself and they like tell you to leave before you even get into the U S or before you cross the official border, then, then you're not allowed to come again. And all this other like crazy stuff that they use to, um, you know, again, to try to find ways to circumnavigate international laws and uh, federal law and 
uh, you know, everything just to, um, find, you know, again, to find ways to, uh, uh, to get around uh, being humans and showing uh, compassion and humanity to other people, especially children. Um, you know, well, I, you know, go ahead. I really appreciate you speaking with me about this. I think, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is a really good way to um, kind of uh, uh, counterpose to what we're hearing, you know, in the media that again, that this is this, you know, like there's this invading army or whatever, and really it's just people, you know, migrating, which is like a normal part of uh, human activity. And in this case, you know, spurred on by a lot of times things that the U.S. has done in other parts of the world and people trying to escape gangs, not people in gangs, but people trying to get away from uh, where there's uh, uh, gang activity going on that's putting them uh, in harm's way. Is there anything else you want to share before you before you go about the situation or about what you saw specifically? Yeah, uh, thanks. A couple things. One is that you, when you were talking about your experience in Texas on the border, you mentioned the, the Clinton administration and sort of trying to figure out when exactly all of this extreme militarization started. And I think that was exactly right to pinpoint the Clinton administration in the 90s, which was a Democratic administration. And yet they were the ones who really started to put up the, the walls in sort of the, the towns that were the major crossing points, whether it's Tijuana in, Mex in uh, California and in Mexico, um, Nogales in Arizona, um, Eagle Pass in Texas. That's when that sort of very visible walls and surveillance towers and all that started going up in those crossing areas. And that's really when the towns on the other side of the border went from being sort of very small towns with not a lot going on to, in some cases, major industrial centers like Tijuana has, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but millions of people, major industry. And that's entirely a result of U.S. militarization of the border and the North American Free Trade Agreement that incentivized companies to go across to Mexico to pay workers less um, harming workers there, super exploiting them while also costing jobs here in the US. And right. so that the Clinton administration, they also put in place in 1996, a law that made it much more difficult, much easier to deport people and more difficult to um, to win asylum cases and so forth. And um, really since then you go through each, each successive administration, it, they've sort of put piled more and more on top. And the Biden administration for better or worse, well, for worse has, continued that. Um, when Biden ran for president, really, probably the issue he could most sharply differentiate himself from Trump on was immigration. You know, you had under Trump, the kids in cages and the separation of families that all of the people with any heart were just outraged about and people poured into the streets to protest it, including a lot of very prominent Democratic politicians, including President Biden himself, who said on day one, he was going to reverse all of these policies that Trump had put in place that were horrific and inhumane. And he he did reverse some of them, so credit where credit's due, but he never reversed all of them and has in recent months actually gone sharply the other direction and has been putting back in place some of these policies and has also, um, you know, I mentioned before that there was, we saw U.S. Army people in Eagle Pass and so his response to this right-wing governor illegally taking uh, border militarization into his own hands has not been to, um, you know, they have done sort of the bare minimum of like, okay, we're going to bring you to court to ask you to stop to do that, right. which they did and they won, but then Texas hasn't stopped. <laughs> and so like the Biden administration hasn't been willing to take any next steps to force them to stop. And in instead they're like, no, we, we agree with you that the border needs to be more, quote unquote, secure, which means militarized. Uh, we'll, we're just going to send in federal troops to do it and not have you, Texas, do it. So we see this over and over again in our lifetimes, right, where Republicans do something completely racist and outrageous and the Democratic Party response, it, rather than giving a principled opposition to that, is to unite with parts of it and be like, no, 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 we can do it better, you know. And so it just pulls the whole political spectrum to the right and the whole debate on immigration to the right. And you lose the actual humanity of the people who are at the center of this issue. And 
you know, not to say that the Biden administration is exactly the same as the Trump administration. There are things that are different. They haven't ended DACA. That's good. Um, you know, but on border militarization, they've just been terrible. And um, the other thing, just the last thing I guess I would want to emphasize is that in Eagle Pass, there is a group there, the Eagle Pass Border Coalition. And this is local activists there, local people. Um, one guy who, Jesse Fuentes, who runs a kayaking business, you know, in the Rio Grande, where he takes people out on the river in kayaks. And nice. now with all of the razor buoys and the yeah, concertina, screws all that, they've, they've messed up his business, right? And so that he, he also opposes what's going on, not just because it hurts his business, but because he has political principles and he's like, these are people, this isn't right. But th this is, uh, you know, it's there's people like that who are involved in, in these efforts to try to stop this insane militarization of their town. And they're so brave and so amazing that they're going up against, they're, they're at the epicenter of this massive po political polarization in this country. They're living at the epicenter of it. They're sitting on a powder keg, right? You have this conflict between a state government who is flaunting uh the the federal government and saying we're you're not doing things right we're just going to do this and the federal government being like hey wait a minute no you that's our job but you know in some ways uh i don't want to be too overly dramatic right but if you look at the run-up to the u.s civil war you see a very similar dynamic right where the country is right. very polarized on an issue uh, on a lot of issues and the state governments in the South are like, we're taking matters into our own hands and doing it our way. And then the federal government at first, you know, Lincoln wasn't like a principled abolitionist or anything against slavery, but he just wanted to preserve the union, right? And so um, I think Biden in some ways is has some similarities to that, right? He doesn't take a political principle, a principled position against border militarization or that no human being is illegal, but he doesn't want like states going rogue and doing their own thing, right? And so you have this, these two sort of forces that are in conflict with each other. And, um, you know, that's incredibly dangerous for the people sitting at the epicenter of this and doing this incredible work to feed immigrants that come through to oppose the militarization of their town and to stand up for what's right. And it was great to just get to meet them and, and to try to amplify their voices. Well, thanks so much for speaking with me, Brad. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your uh, time and uh, love your podcast. All right, take care. And that's our special interview. Thanks for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.